So to start, clearly I know your movies, but I think our viewership needs to know more about you. So can you tell me a little bit about just your background and how you ended up getting to your first feature? Uh, sure, yes. I, um, I did my final semester in college abroad in LA, and I was, like did my internship um, at Blumhouse and I was there when like they made they were they just like wrapped like Insidious or Insidious had just become like a hit and so that's why they like were hiring more interns and uh, so while I was there I made my first movie for 25 grand on weekends and um, we managed to sell it and then as soon as we sold it I just kind of left and made another movie and and that was pod and that was what I was here for last year and then uh, you know, I've just been finding ways to keep making films, I suppose. At what point did you realize, like, you could keep churning out films this fast? Because, like, the most unique thing about you is that, like, you just don't stop. Like, I covered your movie here last year, right. and then you had uh, Darling in the fall, and now here we are with Carnage Park. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've always been doing it this way. Like, I've always ever wanted to make movies, and so it just, the times that, like, I'm sitting waiting, that's when I'm panicking. You know, and um, so, you know, I've got a lot of films that I want to be able to do and a lot of different scripts that I've always wanted. If I get an opportunity, it's like, oh, I'll find a way to make it happen or I'll find the situation that will benefit this story. And that's kind of just how we've been able to keep the momentum going, I guess. And when you say find a way to make it happen, do you mean like finding resources or like if you can't get the finan financing you need to make your movie, you're going to figure out another way to do it? Yeah, I mean, well, Carnage Park a perfect example of like, I wanted to do this after my first film and the financing just kept falling through. And it was always just like a really, like almost there and then it turned into like a haywire type situation and like zero hour. And so we, it was always like, I knew I was going to make it and so even when we were waiting for the financing to happen, like I would still storyboard and I would still kind of like uh, really tweak, but then I would just tweak the script, but then I would just go and make pod instead. And then, you know, we'd loop back around and I'd work on the storyboards a little bit more. And then, you know, uh, if the financing fell through again, like then I just went and made Darling, you know? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all kind of like situational. There's never been a movie that I've made that's been like, okay, great. like. We have two weeks, let's make something. There's, it's always been something in the pipeline, but it never, the timing on the films never works out kind of the way that you plan. That's so impressive, because when I make things, I'm so like tunnel vision, where if I focus on anything else, I see like one project bleeding into another. Right, oh yeah, I don't know. For so whatever reason, like, I think the challenge to me is it's always really exciting to make as different films as possible, because I feel like the only way to be able to keep making movies quickly is to keep you know, pushing yourself and trying new shit and like, you know, always trying to be uh, different. So in a way, like, it's easier to separate all the movies because I know that I'm not going to make like a, a monster movie and a neo-western and somehow have them combined. Your stuff is so incredibly different. Like every single film, I mean, there's really very few elements except for maybe the fact that they could be classified as horror films right. that overlaps whatsoever. Oh yeah, I mean, that's what we kind of try. Like my favorite directors are all directors who dabble in like various genres but they have some sort of imprint of like you can always tell what a Robert Altman movie is and that's what I want to be able that's really impressive and exciting to me so that's what I want to try to be I think to you're do. definitely doing that <laughs> well one day hopefully I'll, I'll see so why Carnage Park uh, why why the title or why why the whole idea uh, I don't know I think I'm really like I love American 70s crime and horror movies and I feel like all of the I've always I'm a huge fan of Sam Peckinpah I'm a huge fan of like of the original Hills Have Eyes you know and and so I feel like it was just this I'm a huge fan of this movie called Punishment Park that came out uh, early 70s totally different it's about um it's a, it's like a fake documentary about Vietnam protesters who get rounded up and uh, they are the targets for soldier trainees in the desert. It's amazing. It's so messed up. It's I want to so go watch great. that movie. It's like infuriating. Uh, it's directed by Peter Watkins and um, you know that's just like it's this kind of like survival desert type movie but it's very politically charged and so when I was making Carnage Park I was like oh that's the great that's a great homage because you know it's I love this idea of, of you know some sort of military esque force hunting, you know, well-to-do or, you know, random strangers in the desert. Uh, also, I love The Most Dangerous Game. I think The Most Dangerous Game is, like, the perfect story ever, and so that's, uh, it's just a kind of combination of all of those. And going back to the title, that's just a genius title. Oh. I mean, really, nothing catches your attention faster than something called Carnage Park. Right, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, it, for a while, like, we were like, what are we going to call it? Uh, when I was writing the script, I was like, is it Murder Park? No, I knew it was going to be something park, but uh, fortunately, it just 
so. Carnage is way more vicious than murder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love movies that kind of make me think, you know, what would I do in that situation? Right. How would I fare? Have you ever put yourself in that mindset here? Like, would you be able to outrun him? Oh, totally not. I mean, like, I wrote it because I was like, oh, I hope that, like, in this survival situation, everyone hopes that they're Ashley Bell's character. You know, everyone hopes that they can somehow be, you know, able to survive something like that and be witty enough to kind of like move forward and so I think like it, I, I love driving through the desert I love Joshua Tree like I love visiting those kind of like really weird things that you find out there but it's always terrifying to me and I always get really uncomfortable pretty pretty quickly so of all the films you made what like kind of concept scares you most is it you know like is it something like this like an actual person who could like shoot you is it more like a ghost thing is it aliens yeah I think I think the thing that scares me inherently and what kind of I've found is like a through line throughout my movies is like the the things that people do to people you know what I mean like there's there's always this overwhelming kind of like like overarching thing that's a little bit more detached from reality but at its very core like I'm terrified of what the human brain prompts someone to do to someone else you know um, so it's it's realism and violence that really kind of scares me just being you know on my way to do whatever and being you know caught up in some guy's catastrophic plan like that's terrifying to me I always think it's like evil entities and things that I can't control or fight back right. against but the way you just articulated that and things that I see on the news now I'm like maybe that's probably it's terrifying the because the thing that I think is like so exciting about Carnage Park is like I purposefully started the movie to not be about you know, like the, the the horror of it. It's like these guys had their own plan and it went awry and then suddenly like it turned into something way worse. And I think that like the the unpredictability of life is very scary. You killed it with the cast on this too. I oh, mean, they killed it. I Pat just... Healy can get scary. Yeah. And like he's like the nicest, sweetest guy. And yeah. like even in Cheap Thrills, I look at him and I'm like, even though you're doing terrible things, like I love you, man. Right. And here... He's like a nightmare. Well, it was awesome. And I mean, I think like what was really cool is that people, he said it himself like, oh, I always play like this neurotic character. And I'm like, no, look, like let's have you be like the confident, you know, sinister entity in the film. And he like, he really went for it. And I mean, it, this was the first kind of movie that really felt like it was, it's getting closer to like my dream of like doing like an Altman-esque ensemble. And with characters or with actors like, Pat and Ashley and James, like you just turn on the camera and they just do something surprising. She every kills time. it in this too. And it's like, you know, she hit it big from Last Exorcism. And I've seen some of the stuff that she's done in between, but nothing that really kind of like popped as much as this did in terms of showing like her range and what she's capable of. Yeah, totally. I mean, she's just like, she is the best actor. And I think like the greatest thing about Ashley is like you give her a stage to really kind of perform and she'll take it as like further than you can ever expect. So, I mean, she was like such a trooper about it. I met her, she's like, there's no ego. She's the nicest person in the world. And she's like, yeah, totally. I'll tumble through the dirt and stab a guy in the neck. Like, it's great. <laughs> was it a tough shoot for her? Um, it wasn't, I don't, I think like we tried to be as it, look, we shot in the desert in the summer for three weeks and everyone just got like so sunburned. We tried to make it as accommodating as possible, but I don't think that I'll, be going back and shooting another daytime horror movie. By the end of like day one, I was so sunburned and uh, someone came up to me and they're like, your lips, they're, we gotta get like medicine for your lips, they're so oh sunburned. Oh my God. <laughs> and so yeah, I mean, it was it was tough in ways, but, um, but I think it was overall, you know, we're doing another movie together, so I think I, I didn't scare her off. <laughs> What's next for you guys? Uh, so we just wrapped. Psychopaths, Yeah, we just right. wrapped a, it's a, it's a very like, kind of sprawling ensemble, you know, serial killer movie that's very heavy-handed, like 70s, uh, you know, Paul Schrader type, oh boy. type violence. Um, I'm gonna fall for this, I can already tell. Yeah, it's cool, it's, it's very, it's, you know, it's the exact opposite of what Carnage Park is. It's very colorful and energetic and crazy, and, uh, and yeah, there's 20 characters in the movie, so it's all very, uh, it, very different. Did you pick the cast from some of your previous movies? Yeah, I, I've used, this is basically like, this is the movie that's like, oh, all my friends are in it, you know, and like, and I get to, I really get a chance to like, work with some, we had some new people in it. Uh, we have Angela Trimber from Trash Fire. And, oh, you know, awesome. Yeah. I mean, after uh, Final Girls last year, she's everyone so should good. know who she is by this point. Totally, and I mean, she's just like, she 
kills it in this movie. And so we have we have a few new people on board, but it's mostly like every. I even have. Oh, you have Sam. I have Sam Zimmerman in the movie. <laughs> I'm dying to see Sam in this movie. He is. He is. Amazing. And Jeremy Gardner, who I've never worked with before, but I'm like so familiar with his work. Like it was really just like like four weeks of just fun, casual, kind of like we're making something crazy. And is this a much bigger production? Like does thing do these movies progressively get bigger and bigger for you? They do, yes. Uh this is this is bigger, um and it's uh it, yeah. So unfortunately, I mean only now if I've been but it, you know, having started making a movie for $25,000, like, it's very easy to be like, oh, okay, I saw I could do that. If I ever need to do that again, I can. But every movie we try to push ourselves to do bigger and, you know, more ambitious and crazier things. Because it doesn't, if, if people are sitting watching my movies that come out, you know, every year and they just kind of plateau, it's not fun for anybody. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So every, this movie, I mean, it took a lot out of me, <laughs> but, but uh, I don't know how you're still standing. I mean, I, I produced one feature last year and I mean, just like wiped me out. Yeah, like, I could not even think about like just jumping back into another one in six months. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know. Um, but for whatever reason, like I sleep less when I'm worrying about if something happens than I do when I'm shooting. When I'm shooting, I'm, I'm like, I, I sleep like a baby and it's wonderful, you know? Do you have like a movie making vice or like not, like something that you need on set to kind of keep the energy going? Uh, I, do, I drink a lot of black coffee. Yeah, all right. Like, like there by, it is. by day, by day four, I start drinking coffee all day. <laughs> all right. You make me feel a little better about my coffee intake now. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, it's funny because I'm like, I'm really, I don't. Like, I'm really neurotic and kind of like I'm a hypochondriac, so <laughs> like it's just natural adrenaline, but uh, but coffee is I know when I start needing it a lot. So, what was your reaction when you were completely sunburned? Uh, I was like, No, 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 Jesus. no one put anything on my lips. Oh, god, <laughs> I don't even take Advil really, like, oh, I'm wow. that kind of like it's not for any other reason, just that I'm like. Oh, sometimes you need it, especially when you're shooting. <laughs> Definitely. So you didn't produce Carnage Park, right? I did not, no. Is there any reason that you chose to do that on this one? Um, for, for on Psychopath or just for Carnage Park? Just for Carnage Park versus your other films where I know you did serve as a producer as well. Yeah, I don't know. I think, well, it was just like, it was just a different group of people and this was the kind of the movie where it's like, it was, it was very much like, all right, well, I'm going to stay in my little creative bubble. I don't have to worry about the ship sinking all the time. Now, granted, like, I feel like when I am a full producer on the movies and I do have like the inherent terror of the ship sinking at any hour mm -hmm. in the day, like it is also weirdly refreshing, but this one was a nice one to be able to step back and be like, okay, I can focus completely on the artistic, you know, creative side of, of the film. And is it, would I do it again? No, but also I had uh, the producers on the film trusted me a lot and gave me total freedom to do whatever I wanted, so I didn't really kind of have to worry about it. Smart people. Yeah, like when the cop car showed up the day beforehand and the windshield was shattered, like I didn't have to worry about finding oh another boy. period cop car. Yeah, <laughs> you lucky know? you. It was great. Was, were, there any ever, were there ever any other times where you thought like the ship was sinking? Or maybe not sinking, but like some sort of snag in the production? Uh, well, it's funny because at this point on this movie, the movie had fallen apart so many times that by the time we were shooting, I, I was like, I see, like, I had a lot of comfort thinking like, if it somehow goes down, it'll be such a catastrophe that that'll be it. You know, like it's you almost like make peace with it. But no, I mean, throughout the throughout the entire shoot, the only real problem that we had was one day, the only day I was supposed to have squibs. You know. Uh, the sky opened up and it just like in the middle of the California drought, like it started pouring rain. And I was like, I was like, well, that's it. Like, what am I going to do? And then we broke for lunch early. And then as soon as we did, it stopped raining for like 20 minutes and we got my squib shots and then we were it. <laughs> it was amazing. I like that story. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, I was going to ask about the weather too. Cause like in the desert, I imagine you're not getting very much rain. No, we got a ton of rain. It was the ridiculous, it was the most ridiculous experience. And like what me and my cinematographer concluded very early on is like, we're not gonna worry about. It. We're like we're just gonna shoot it. We it will be we'll be able to frame the movie so it looks consistent throughout. Like even if you look at Jaws, like shots just don't match and it doesn't matter. Yeah. And so we like took that approach and it was a lot more relaxing than being like we have to wait for clouds now. You know. To a certain extent, it feels like if someone's focusing on the shots matching, right? You're, you're probably not doing something else. Totally, right. Totally. Totally. And I mean, like you look at like Martin Scorsese's movies and continuity is all over the place, but. 
they're great. Are there any continuity errors you notice in any of your films that like drive you nuts? Like even if nobody else notices it. Uh, drive me. N I'm I'm a little bit. I think that like for the most part, no. On my in my first film, there are a couple like things that I'm like I'm like okay, like that's a, that's very that's a, like a little kid making a movie. Um, <laughs> and no, at this point, I feel like we work on the movies for so long that by the time that people see them, like, I can't even look at them anymore because they don't look like movies to me, if that makes sense. Because when you look at, like, scenes every single day for six months, you start, there. the magic of cinema has disappeared pretty much. So I think for the most part, yeah, I, well, I sit and watch all the movies and I'm like, okay, this, you know, I hope nobody notices everything, <laughs> you know? But uh, I think that's just the inherent nature of making art in general. You always see your fingerprints on any sculpting you do and nobody usually does, so. Now, I wrote this in my review and I want to ask you, but I just imagine that like someday soon some studio is going to snatch you up and you're going to be attached to some like big name project. Well, we'll see. Is that, is that something you would even consider? Because like, you have such a good thing going with low budget films, like making it your way and really making them stand out in that respect. Sure. I mean, it would it would be. I'm not the dude who would do Friday the Thirteenth Part Nineteen. You know, like I'm not I'm not that kind of guy. But I mean, like, if I had a situation where someone came to me and said, like, Oh, do you want to make Boogie Nights? Like, of course. You know, like it there. It would have to be like a particular situation. Like, I'm not dying to like get the big studio job now. You know, I think like it's very exhilarating to try to do a whole lot of different things. But. Uh, I'd never say no, you yeah. know? Part of me wants it for you just so, like, your name gets out there more. It's sure. like, I always want to push, like, low-budget horror out as much as I possibly can, because, like, you know, it's it's hard to be aware of it when you're just focusing on the big new release every right. week. Totally, yeah, and I think, I think, but it's, you know, it's support from people like you that really kind of help that, you know, us be able to keep making movies that way, you know? And I think that that's very exciting. And totally, like, and I think that one day when, when it does happen, I want it to be the right thing because I think you hear more horror stories than not of indie people, of indie filmmakers who go and make a studio movie and it's just a disaster and then they don't get to make another movie again. Yeah. And so I... Or like remake sequels or right. just one of those used and abused formats. Totally, yeah. And I mean, like, it, it, just because you can do it and just because it's there immediately, like, doesn't mean that you necessarily should and I think that w as soon as the timing does happen great but I, I want it to be as good and I want to feel as good about the movies as I do these ones. It's a good policy to have. I try. <laughs> do you have a lot of budding filmmakers coming to you and being like I want to make my first movie how do I do it? Uh, no well it's funny because I feel like no not really um, sometimes but it's more I also like I feel like I'm still in that realm of like I'm one of those budding filmmakers, so I always harass Larry Fessenden, you know, like, how do I do it, what can I do, you know, and so I've got a whole bunch of, like, uh, different kind of, like, filmmaker friends in that kind of realm, but in terms of, like, I don't know, I don't know if, like, the teenagers have gotten into my movies yet, you know, I think that, like, a lot of, a lot of them are not, a lot of my movies are geared kind of more towards, like, you know, I don't know if the kids will really enjoy them. <laughs> well, I hope they do. It is very inspiring the way you turn out movies. Oh, thank Like, as you. someone who had a very hard time making her own, I, I'll say it's, like, insanely impressive to me that someone can make so so much quality work so fast. I appreciate that. I really do. You know, and I, I'm trying. Yeah, I, I don't ever want... If I ever make a movie where I'm like, yeah, that was easy and, you know, it was... That was fine. Like, I don't, I don't think you should make movies that way, you know? Like, if it becomes too easy, then you're not pushing yourself hard enough.